what this whole OpenAI saga has shown us is that, I mean, obviously we can't have something like this being developed by just like a handful of, you know, weird people, unaccountable billionaires in the Bay Area. This is actually something that I've been telling, saying to people for years now. Obviously this is not the right governance structure. But the weirdest thing I would tell you is technology should be a tool. It should not be a goal in and of itself. Hi, I wanted to jump in and give a shout out to our sponsor, NetSuite by Oracle. I'm a journalist and getting a single source of truth is nearly impossible. If you're a business owner, having a single source of truth is critical to running your operations. If this is you, you should know these three numbers, 36,000, 25, 1. 36,000 because that's the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25 because NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need all in one place. As I said, I'm not the most organized person in the world, and there's real power to having all of the information in one place to make better decisions. This is an unprecedented offer by NetSuite to make that possible. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance, absolutely free, at netsuite.com slash I on AI. That's I on AI, E-Y-E-O-N-A-I, all run together. Go to netsuite.com slash I on AI to get your own KPI checklist. Again, that's netsuite.com slash I on AI, E-Y-E-O-N-A-I. They support us, so let's support them. Hi, my name is Craig Smith, and this is I on AI. In this episode, I speak again with Connor Leahy. Uh, he's the founder and CEO of a startup called Conjecture that's working on AI alignment. Before that, he was one of the founders and leaders of a group called Eleuther AI that built one of the world's first open source uh, large language models. Uh, and Connor is uh, concerned about AI safety, about where AI development uh, is going, concerned about uh, the, the push towards uh, artificial general intelligence, and has a lot of thoughts about uh, what we should be doing to control development so that we don't end up creating something that is harmful to humanity. I talked to him particularly because I wanted to hear his thoughts on the open AI saga, uh, which highlighted for a lot of people uh, the dangers of having such a small group of people uh, controlling such a fundamentally powerful technology today. Uh, I hope you find the conversation as interesting as I did. So I'm Connor. I'm currently the CEO of Conjecture. We're an AI company in London focused on AI safety and building architectures for AI systems that are more understandable and controllable and various other things. I also do a bit of work in policy regulation, public messaging, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, before this, I was well known as one of the, co uh, one of the founders of Eleuther AI, which was kind of one of the first, if not the first, kind of like open source, large language models, research building kind of groups. And technically, even before that, I was someone who worked on open source uh, GPT-2 as I think maybe literally the first person. 
Yeah. And uh, so last time we spoke uh, was after the release of ChatGPT and GBD4, and uh, you were very concerned, as were a lot of people, and a lot of people continue to be, about uh, releasing these kinds of models into the public before having uh, fully explored uh, the the safety issues or uh, without having adequate guidelines. Uh, but it struck me during this open AI saga that we have lived through the last uh, week that having this kind of powerful technology in the hands of a handful of people uh, who have uh, different agendas and and can't get along is in itself a security issue. And uh, I, I would think that having uh, these models open source where everyone can see the data they were trained on in particular, because uh, even Llama, I've learned, uh, doesn't uh, make public the training data, uh, but having the data uh, open for all to see and having the weights of the models open so people can uh, improve them or play with them or whatever, that to me seems like a much safer uh, path than having proprietary models. But I, I wanted to hear how your thinking has evolved on that. In the 1940s, and in the early 1950s, the Soviet Union built a what's called a closed city around what would be known as the Mayak facility. The Mayak facility was the largest and one of the first, well, I don't know if it was literally the first, but it was one of the largest nuclear facilities for the Soviet Union in their breakthrough development attempt to build a nuclear bomb. To give a bit of a flavor for what Mayak and similar facilities that existed throughout the Soviet Union were like, there was a there was a program where if you got you know, caught by the secret police and you were being sent to a gulag for the rest of your life, you were given an option. Either you go to Siberia, work yourself to death for the rest of your life, or you get sent to Mayak for only three months. And if you serve your term, you're free. Hmm. Sounds great, doesn't it? Well, no one survived the three months. So what happened, of course, is, is that one of the first things that the Americans developed while developing the bomb is the HEPA filter, which is a form of air filter that is, that is powerful enough to be able to filter radioactive material very sufficiently out of the air, making it safe for the workers. The Soviets didn't bother developing HEPA filters, <laughs> not really. So a lot of people died. To this day, uh, Lake Karakai, which is near the Mayak facility, is one of the most radioactive places on earth. Uh, so much so that it is said that standing next to it for an hour can kill a man. These are all just some fun facts that surely have nothing to do with the topic we're talking about today. Um, they are, it's a story about how some people who were pretty bad people developed something or were working on something pretty dangerous, and then other people got access to it. And also really bad things happened because even worse people got access to it. Now, from this, I don't conclude oh, so we should have just just had everyone develop plutonium. That would have made it safer. This is not that I draw from this conclusion from the story. Now, nuclear power is obviously very different from AI in many factors. So why even bring it up? So I can ask the, com com the question in the other direction, though. You're talking about AI. You're talking about AGI. So let's, let's like focus on AGI. I'm not really interested in talking about the risks of like, you know, current day models like ChatGPT or something. We could talk about those too. They are real. There are real risks from those, but they're not the kind where I think like, you know, we have to stop all publication necessarily. But let's talk about AGI systems. Why would we, what reference class does AGI fall into? Is it like open source? Is it like nuclear bombs? Is it like something different? The reference class we choose forms our thinking around something which is fundamentally none of those things. AGI is in nukes. AGI is in open source. It's not Linux. It's something very different. So while it has things in common with all of those things, you know, AGI runs on computers, Linux runs on computers, pretty similar, you know, 
And it has other things in common with nuclear bombs. You know, nuclear bombs can kill everybody. AGI can kill everybody. Those are things in common. Is it more like nukes? Is it more like open source? And we won't, at some point, we have to actually drop down from the metaphors and into the actual models of reality. So from my perspective, I think you're completely correct. Is that what this whole open AI saga has shown us is that, I mean, obviously we can't have something like this being developed by just like a handful of, you know, you know, weird people, unaccountable billionaires in the Bay Area. Like, obviously they're not acting in humanity's best interest to no one's surprise. Like a couple of months ago, Sam Altman was, you know, interviewed about this and he said, oh yeah, the board can fire me at any time. If I go by a mission, I think that's important. And then they try to fire him. <laughs> Yeah. And he's bad. And well, that didn't work. So this is actually something that I've been telling, saying to people for years now. I've gotten into some, uh, you know, disagreements, um, heated disagreements, let us call them, with some of the people who were involved with the creation of the board and or, you know, in favor of the existence of the board. And the point I always made to them was just like, this obviously cannot control a, you know, charismatic billionaire, you know, political mastermind. Like, why the hell would you think it would? This is crazy. This is, and this is exactly what we saw play out. And I'm not even trying to make a comment on Sam Altman good, Sam Altman bad. I'm just saying, obviously, he was just not going to just see, oh, gosh, darn. I guess the board said, no more AI for me. Guess I'm going to stop. That's not how men like him work. And that's obviously not what was going to happen. And you think, like, the politically unsavvy nerds, you know, could, like, write a document that would like convince someone like him to stop? No, of course not. So obviously this is not the right governance structure. I, I fully agree with this, but there's a great saying, which is that reverse stupidity is not intelligence. If you take mm. something stupid and you take the opposite of it, it's probably also stupid. And so this is, so the fact that this governance structure doesn't work for me does not say that therefore there should be no governance structure. This to me does not follow. Yeah. So, but, but open source, I mean, you are, are, I'm sure, very familiar with Yen LeCun's argument that, yeah, the, 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 that uh, open sourcing uh, can, can lead to uh, some abuse by bad actors, but by and large, uh, the, 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 the vast majority of people that will be uh, working on an open source model, contributing to it or building products off of it, will be doing so with with uh, you know not not without nefarious intent, and that the larger the open source community, the quicker uh, it would be able to respond to uh, to bad actors or, or misuse or, or to the, the more, uh, people available to, to build guardrails and spot, uh, uh, weaknesses and that sort of thing. So, uh, that, that argument makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, at the beginning when the, you know, pause letter came out, uh, and around the time that we talked, I thought, yeah, this stuff is too dangerous uh, to be open source. But, uh, but, but I'm changing my mind, and I, I wanted to hear whether the this uh, this episode has changed your mind at all. I'll I'll make three points in uh, reaction to that. The first one is a story. The second one is a heuristic. And the third one is a true observation from my own life. So mm -hmm. first, the story. The story is that the smallpox virus genome is currently online. You can go download it. It's a small text right. file. You can just go download it to your computer. Another fact of this story is that a couple of years ago, Canadian scientists recreated an extinct version of smallpox called horsepox. They revived it. They may, and it was functional and viable and infectious. And they published how to do it. Do you think either of those things are good? Now you can argue, well, if we have more eyes on the smallpox virus, then something, something, you know, good things happen, but this isn't really a model. So this brings me to the second point. The second point is offense versus defense. The way technologies work is that some favor offense, some favor defense, very few are symmetric. Most of the time, and most of the time, offense wins. 
it is usually easier to destroy than it is to protect. There are mm -hmm. exceptions to this rule. For example, cryptography is a interesting exception where defense is easier than offense. But in most cases, it is easier to build a bomb than it is to build a reactor, you know, a safe controlled burn. So all things being equal, you should expect that if you have a technology and you distribute it equally, that there will be more destruction. This is the default case. This is what you should expect by default. Most technologies that allow you to destroy don't immediately give you a way to defend against it. Developing vaccines is harder than developing bioweapons. It's much easier to crank out a bunch of bioweapons, and then you have to develop vaccines in response to that, which is already super hard because you know who knows how far the virus already is. So just because the technology is why the aspect does not mean a defense wins. The, uh, whether offense or defense wins is a property of reality. It's not a property of your morals or of your ideology. And a third point is an observation from my own life is that I used to work in open source. I was one of the very first people to work on it. And I had similar views to Likun. And, um, you know, assuming he holds these views genuinely, um, which, you know, I, I hope he does. I don't know him uh, very well. I've talked to him maybe once. Um, and I think this is just naive and wrong. It's just, in my experience, what happens when you build AI models and you release them open source is that the first thing that happens to get uploaded to Hugging Face and then a guy called The Bloke, that's literally his name, uncensors them, undoes any RLHF training or other security training you might have done, trains them on all the newest data to make them more powerful, more general, more whatever, uploads them again, 4chan downloads it down, you know, uses them for whatever their applications are, whether it's, you know, pornography mostly or like spam or whatever, et cetera. And now maybe this is fine, right? Like, you know, you know, maybe we say, yeah, it's okay. If people want to use their LLMs for porn, so what? That's okay. Sure. What I'm saying is, is the empirical observation is that the amount of effort that gets put into making these things safer or more controllable is absolutely pathetic compared to the amount of effort that the open source community puts into making these things more powerful, more general, and less controllable. This is just an empirical fact. This is just actually, if you go online, you pick the top ta thousand LLM repos. How many of them are about controlling the models better versus making them faster, making them more efficient, distilling mm -hmm. them, making them more, et cetera. And the fact is that the often, like the, the, the unbalance here is like, it's not even funny. And mm -hmm. I understand, right? This is not to say that the people working on this technology are like morally evil. I think this is an important thing to understand. There's an incentive from people like Lacun and other like big tech, you know, people like talking heads to try to focus on it's only the evil people's fault because that absolves them of responsibility. Meta wants open source because it absolves them of responsibility as a corporation. They can't get sued because, oh, it was the user's fault. And this is also what's happening in the EU AI Act right now is that people like Lacun are lobbying to remove foundation models from regulation in the EU and saying it's that their uses should be regulated. This is the same thing as when, for example, plastic companies invented recycling. They invented it so that it was the user's fault that there is all this plastic pollution. Like, oh, see, we would have recycled it, but unfortunately the users just didn't do it. This is, a, this is gaslighting and this is a, mis, a complete unbalance of power the externalities of plastic pollution should be on the, the ones who are most suited to addressing this externality, who are creating this externality. It shouldn't be on the user. And the same thing applies to foundation models, is that these systems can do things. They can be used for many things. And we should be taking the big companies building these systems. It's not like these open source models are being built by like, you know, plucky little teenagers in their, in their you know, rooms. As a plucky teenager that did do that, I'm saying most of the ones being built now are being made by like the UAE and Meta. Like these aren't the little guys. These are big guys trying to shirk their responsibility to society. Well, then what, what's the lesson from, from the open AI saga? That that you just need a bigger board, or you, you need less. Uh... The lesson is is that none of these structures are correct. This is what we have governments for. This is the same lesson that we've had over and over again. Is that like self regulation does not work. It has never worked. Self regulation. This is like 
tobacco companies self-regulating themselves. This does not yeah. work. And we as a society have developed a mechanism. I'm not saying it's a perfect mechanism by any means, but we do have a mechanism for inter in intervening in systems that have extreme high externalities that are not self-regulatable. And it's called the government. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I mean, there has been a lot of work at, uh, at the government level, not as much in the U S as in Europe. Uh, but, but how, how, do, I mean, uh, obviously these, uh, models are so commercially, uh, the potential is so commercially, uh, exciting that, uh, fines aren't going to, uh, matter. You're not going to be able to find people uh, to to behave in ways that the government wants them to. There's got to be something stronger than that. So, do you, have you thought about about that? I mean, how do you regulate these things? One of my one of the most inspiring moments from the history, I think, of science and society is many decades ago. Um, biologists and chemists and so on, realized that human cloning should be possible. Like it should be possible to do this. They were still mm -hmm. far from having the actual technology to perform right. a human clone, but they found out it should be possible. And they reasonably understood, wait, that might be really destabilizing. Like that could be, re we don't know what the consequences, but maybe it's great. You know, maybe there's, you know, there's many benefits from human cloning as well, but like, let's chill out. We don't know, like we don't know. And this seems huge. This is, isn't just like another thing. This is not a 10% more effective, you know, cough drop, like human cloning is a big deal. And so heroically long before the technology existed, they came together and banned it and said, let's have a moratorium. Let's not mm -hmm. do this until we've had a bit more time to figure out what the hell we as a society want about this. And this wasn't one board. This wasn't one CEO being like, I will, you know, take a moratorium on this. No, it was the scientific community and governments coming together and working very, very hard to create a moratorium. A moratorium is what we do when we are faced with something which we know is huge and we don't know how to deal with. That's what scientists do. You have a moratorium. And we should have a moratorium on AGI. This is what we need to do. And can you enforce a moratorium? Yeah. I mean, it's like technically, like physically, like, yeah, obviously, like that's not that hard. Whether people will do that, whether people want to do that, whether people can overcome the incredible political power that big tech has, that's the more interesting question. It's not like the government obviously has the ability, like the CIA can track every GPU in the country if it wants to. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if, you want, if the NSA wants to shut down, just press a button. Like, that's not the problem. You know, if you want to throw a couple CEOs in jail, like, sure, like the FBI can do that. Like, physically, this is not a problem. It's, pol it's a political problem. This is not a physical problem. This is a political problem. The political problem is, well, if you have legislation around this kind of stuff, well, we just saw what happens if you try to fire Sam Altman. Do you think he's going to be okay with taking his GPUs away? Well, no, I expect that's going to be a hard fight. I expect you know, Microsoft lobbyists will fight that tooth and nail. I expect many people will fight this. And this is why, like, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to give, point you, paint you a rosy picture of the future. I'm not optimistic that things are going to go well. We have an unprecedentedly huge political problem here. I think mm. I'd like to say is the thing that's killing us right now it's not AGI. AGI doesn't exist yet. It's people. It's politics that is killing us. Right, right. But uh, and and to that point that AGI doesn't exist, uh, uh, not not so much all the other. I mean, yes, no doubt the, the political systems are are not equipped uh, to deal with uh, the big problems facing humanity. But in this case. Uh, AGI doesn't exist. Uh, I don't know how you would ban AGI because no one really knows how and when it might emerge, if it ever does. Uh, at the level of the tech now, I mean, w w what are you what are you suggesting? And I I'm not putting you on the spot. I don't expect you to. Have, oh, have I have policy proposals. I have very <laughs> concrete policy proposals. Here are, here are three. Um, okay. The first one is a compute cap. 
there should be a limitation that no single training run, no single AI system can be built with more than a certain amount of compute. So luckily we are, so we are very lucky that current frontier AI systems, more and more general purpose systems require more and more computing resources. These computing resources are very easy to track. They're very bulky. They take lots of specialized knowledge, lots of energy. The kinds of supercomputers that can train a GPT-4 or GPT-5 are only built by like three companies in the world and they're all in the US. So like this is a solvable problem and we should put a ban on, you know, there should be like a registration process for, you know, frontier models up to a certain limit. And beyond that, there should be just ban, just a moratorium. Just you are not allowed to perform any experiment that requires more than, I don't know, 10 to the 24 or 10 to 25 or whatever flops. Um, flop being a unit of measurement for yeah. computing power. And this is easily enforceable. This is absolutely something that like technically is enforceable with it's just a political problem. Um, and this buys you time. Then your, our scientists figure out, you spend time actually figuring out how far is AGI away? How dangerous is it? How do we control the things? Blah, blah, blah. Then we can talk about those kind of things. The first thing right. is to buy time. The second proposal, or, or unless you want to comment on that. Well, just on that, uh, you, you're, you're talking about uh, limiting uh, commercial uh, products, but if if when you say then that gives the the research community time to figure these out things out, they're going to have to uh, experiment with larger models. So there's got to be some. some it, I, to be understand, thing. to be to be clear, these these levels are insane. Like ten to the twenty four, ten to the twenty five flop is an unimaginably large amount of computing power. There are no academic labs basically that need this for research. Safety research. This is ridiculous. There is just no. So this is a common propaganda piece that big labs like to say is like, oh, we need more compute to do safety research. Maybe this is true. I have not seen it. This is just not what has actually happened. Just purely empirically speaking, there is. I have seen. Basically, no safety AGI relevant research that required more than like, you know, a GPT-3 that you couldn't have done with GPT-3 level of compute or less. I have like, maybe it exists, but I sure as hell as I have not seen it. Okay. And if it and so, so yeah, yeah. limiting uh, compute is, is one uh, proposal. What, what are the others you, you mentioned? Two others I would recommend. Um, the second is a strict liability for model developers. So what this means, so strict liability means that the intentions of the developer do not matter. It would matter is that if a harm is caused, the developer is liable. Um, I think this should basically exist for the whole supply chain is that if, a, if you create externalities, you have to pay for them. And this, this aligns the incentives of everyone aligned on the chain currently. There are no incentives for developers to develop to minimize the externalities of their systems. Currently, you as an open source developer can make an arbitrarily dangerous thing that causes arbitrarily much damage, and you have no incentive to avoid this. As a concrete example, which not even going to AGI, is voice cloning systems. There are right now on GitHub systems you can just download, which can take you know, 15 seconds of your voice. Clone it perfectly and, you know, go call, call your kids, call your wife, you know, just manipulate them, call in a SWAT hit on your, on you using your own voice. This is all doable. And the people developing these systems have zero liability. They have, don't even feel bad about it. They don't even have any conscience because it's open source, Craig. If it's open source, it must be good. My ideology says so. And you know, when your ideology tells you something is morally right, then it's good as we've seen throughout history. So it's. So we have to align incentives here somewhere along the line. You know, if a, it reminds me of cars and seatbelts in the uh, you know, 70s, where car manufacturers fought tooth and nail to not have seatbelts. They, they fought it viciously with propaganda and with lawsuits and with everything they could throw at it because they said, well, it's the driver's fault if he gets into an accident. It's not our fault. Like, you know, we just build cars. If they drive it poorly and they die, well, it's not our fault. And we, you know, the people rightfully told them to go fuck themselves. Like, no, you have to build a safe product. You can't like, it's, the, the, it's not a moral question. It's kind of like the point I want to make. I'm not making an ideological point. I'm not saying my religion says 
that seat belts are good. I'm like, I don't care. I care. Do seat belts mean that less people die? And the answer is, yeah, like they make cars safer. So then I want seat belts. Cool. And the same thing applies to open source. Does Linux being open source result in more safety? The truth is, yeah, looks pretty obviously the case. So I'm in favor of Linux being open source. Awesome. Great. You know, does, you know, some 7 billion parameter model be open source positive or negative? I don't know, probably positive, like probably so. Um, I'm not sure. Like there's a lot of downsides there as well, but like, it seems like it probably is positive. AGI being positive, you know, open source, you know, that does not seem positive to me at all. That does not, that seems like a recipe for disaster. So it's, I'm not trying to make an ideological point. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm not saying all these things are good. All these things are bad. I'm saying we have to look at things at a case by case basis. This is how proper regulation works. Proper regulation shouldn't be ideological. It shouldn't be everything is regulated as A or B. That would be terrible regulation. Yeah. Well, so that was uh, the, the capping of uh, uh, the the compute on training runs, uh, shifting liability to the uh, model developer. What was the third one? So the third one that I think should be done is that there should be a kill switch. And what I mean by this is it doesn't have to be literally a switch. What I mean is there should be a protocol that any developer of frontier AI systems uh, needs to implement by which at a given notice, any frontier uh, training runs or deployments can be shut down in under a minute. So when it, the reason for this is not per se, because I need, I, I think necessarily that this would be very helpful if AGI actually happens. If AGI actually happens, this is probably useless. The reason I think this is good is because we should have the institutional capacity to do these kinds of things. There should be every six months, you know, there should be a fire alarm. There should be a fire drill where everyone has to practice. Like in the next five minutes, all AI companies have to go offline for 60 seconds. If not, you get slapped with a huge fine. This is the kinds of protocols you want to have in worlds where you have tail risks, where like things can blow up, where you can have these kind of things. And then there should be a multilateral, you know, like, you know, K of N kind of system around this, you know, like maybe all major, you know, global powers have one of these buttons. And if, you know, three or five of them push it or like, you know, seven of 10 or whatever, then the, the alarm, you know, the, the system kicks in. This is the kind of institutional building which doesn't save us, but it's a hell of a lot better than nothing. And and how, how do you see this, these kinds of proposals uh, moving through the policy making frameworks? Uh, I mean, there is, uh, you know, some advance in, in the European Union. Uh, you know, the White House has come out with its executive order, which as yet doesn't have any real concrete uh, government and government governance policy in it, but it's, it's, it uh, sort of lays out the things that we should be thinking about. Yeah. Where, where do you see uh, uh, these things uh, going? What sort of a timeline do you think that governments uh, are being educated enough that they can deal with this? who, what government is going to lead? Is it the EU? Will it be the US? Who should it be? Uh, and then, of course, you've got the other side of the world, Russia and China, uh, who who have very different agendas and may not want to regulate at all. So when people ask me questions like this, and they're like, Connor, what's your probability of X happening? And then my follow-up question is usually, is it X conditioned on me and other people doing something about it or not? Because I expect if they condition on me and other people don't do anything about it, then yeah, I just think nothing will happen if big tech wins and then we die. I think it will be very heroic or special. It will just be new products keep happening, AI keep going up, and then just one day humanity's not in control anymore and we have no idea what's going on. And then it's just over. I don't think it will be dramatic. I think we will just get more and more confused. We won't understand what's going on anymore. Weirder and weirder things will happen. More and more politics, economics, you know, markets, um, media is controlled by AI, fully or even just fully generated by AI. There will be no more movies, all just AI generated. And then just 
humanity will just not be in control anymore. And then one day we fall over dead for some reason that we don't understand. That's what I expect will happen by default. And along the way, to be clear, big tech will make a lot of money. So, you know, go, go buy that Microsoft stock. Um, you know, you'll, you'll get really rich just before you die. Um, so, um, if I condition on someone actually doing something about this, I do think there is hope. I don't think there's a lot of hope, but there is hope. And the main hope I see from this is, is that the general public fucking hates AI. It's unfathomable how much normal people hate AI. Yeah. They use it, of course, but like they're freaked out by it, which is just like completely the correct reaction. It's just these like crazy, bizarre, like weirdo tech people like you and me who are not instantly like, wait, that's actually like, let's not do that. Like what, like if you talk to any normal person, you're like, Hey, these people are building systems that are, you know, smarter than humans. They're like, don't like, what? don't do that. That's, that's no, that seems really dangerous. Don't do that. Well, all the tech people are like, oh, but actually you see uh, my proposal, you know, because I'm, you know, will make it fine. Or actually universal love means that AI systems will love, or like whatever, you know, whatever. I don't even know what these people say anymore. I think they've given up making arguments at this point um, and they're just vibing. Um, so I don't even know if there's an argument to debunk there. Um, so like from my perspective, it's, um, we are building these systems. They are going to be built by default unless we do something about it. So the general public wants these systems to not be built, or at least for us to slow down until we can make them safe and we understand them better and they can integrate into society, et cetera, et cetera. So now you might ask the question, okay, well, that's true. Why is fuck all happening? And that's a good question. And now we have to talk about models of policy change and like global coordination. Um, which um, at least how I think about this problem generally is that the general public actually does have power in the West and like in democratic countries. It's very fashionable among elites to sneer and be like, oh, actually, you see the, the populace, you know, they don't have true control. You know, we live in a whatever the words are that people like to use. Um, and this is to a large degree true but it's not fully true. The main problem is, is that the general public has extremely short attention spans and is extremely discoordinated. This is the main problem. The bottleneck on policy action currently is not will of the people. It's not ability to enforce regulation. It's coordination. It's getting people to actually do something about it you know, to actually write letters to their senators, actually put things on their desks, actually yell at them on the phone, you know, actually like, you know, talk about it on social media, et cetera, et cetera. This is the kind of thing that's currently missing, basically campaigning. This is the kind of stuff that is missing. And I expect that if you did this well, if you raise this to saliency about people, you didn't have to, you wouldn't have to convince them. And I'm saying this because empirically, this has been true in my experience like talking to people and also like doing stuff like focus groups and stuff. I found that you don't really need to convince people very much. You mostly just have to tell them facts, just have to, you know, just like present them with, Hey, this is what's going on right now. And then mostly they converge to the, like a reasonable beliefs around like, Hey, that's scary. Don't do that. So I think this is currently the best path we have. I'm also you know, excited to talk to politicians and I talk to many of them, most in the UK and the EU because I'm UK based, um, but it's hard because, you know, politicians have similar problems. They have very little attention span because they have so many things they need to do. Um, there's so many things haranguing them. And my model of policymakers is basically that the, fu the ultimate goal of a politician is to not get blamed. So it's if because as a politician, you have really, you have like, I have simple. So, any if there's any policymakers listening or any staffers or so on, I feel you. I, I, you're in a shit spot. I get it. Cause like, he, basically, the way I see it is like, there's like kind of like a two by two grid of like what you do as, as a, as a politician, what you can do. So the idea is that there's a default action is that in a common, in our common 
you know, feelings around an issue, there is something that is the default thing to do, which is usually nothing. If you do the default action and it goes wrong, well, you're not blamed, you know, because, you know, you, you did the sensible thing, not your fault. If you do the default action and it goes well, well, great, you're a genius, you know, good job. If you do the non-default action and it goes great, cool, yeah, you're, you're good, great. If you do the non-default action and it goes bad, then you get blamed. That's how you get blamed. So you may notice from this payoff matrix that it is always better to take the default action rather than a non-default action. It is always better for the politician to not stray off the path. And this is universally true. So it's easy to yell at politicians and be like, they have no spine, they have no courage and whatever. And yeah, that's true for many of them. Many of them are just, yeah, just, you know, they just don't care, true. But some do, and they do go off the path and they get burned for it. And that sucks, but it is how the game is. So that what we can do as the people is we have to change what the default action is. We have to change the narrative from, I guess we just keep bumbling along until we die to how the fuck dare you keep bumbling? Like cease your bumbling immediately. Bumbling is no longer accepted. And that's my biggest hope at the moment. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> when we spoke last time, uh, again, right uh, as GPT-4 was being released, uh, one of your immediate concerns was that uh, these king things can be hooked up to uh, systems that can take action. And uh, I don't remember if we talked about auto GPT that, that first, uh, I haven't looked at, at what's happened with that, but that first attempt to create an, an agent that could use LLMs, uh, but that has developed, uh, a pace and we're now on the cusp of seeing, uh, sort of an explosion of AI agents that can leverage the power of large language models or other other tools. Uh, I, I had uh, a, a guy on earlier uh, from NewsGuard, a company that builds databases to to try and help uh, companies, tech companies, identify. Uh, uh, disinformation uh and and combat it uh and we were talking about you know once you have these agents building uh you know creating disinformation not only creating the disinformation but distributing it on on a massive scale and and maybe on a massively parallel scale uh the internet public discourse everything is going to get very uh, confusing, uh, because, uh, you're not going to be able to tell what's real and what's not real. And, and people who, which is the majority who are not, uh, particularly careful about where they're getting their information will, will be manipulated. So uh, yeah, this, this, uh, the coming AI agent era, uh, how, how do you deal with that? I mean, I know, get your affairs in order. <laughs> um, I, a number of years ago, um, after like post GPT-2, it was around GPT-3 time. Um, that's how we mark the eras now. It's like, instead of years, we just use GPTs now. <laughs> um, I was invited to a work kind of like, like just like a discussion group. Um, uh, with some open AI people, policy people, like disinformation experts and stuff like this about the potential for misinformation and like so on from uh, language models. So it's like before GPT-4, before chat GPT and so on. So, mm -hmm. and, you know, listen politely to all these like, you know, well-credentialed experts with their, you know, triple Stanford professorships or Harvard, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Um, talk about like oh, misinformation and bias and whatever. And then when it came my turn to talk, my reaction was like, holy shit, you're all so under, like you're, you're being so optimistic. It's so much worse. 
than any of you. You're like, oh, it could make it easier for far righters to. Dis-. I'm like, man, that's 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 fucking children's plight compared to what you could do with these things. Like, you were truly are not creative. Like, if you think that's the worst that can happen, oh, they're going to generate some fake news and some like Russian disinfo websites. I mean, oh boy, that would be nice. That's the nice timeline. It's going to be much worse than that. It's already getting worse like that. Talk about full, fully automated cults with fully automated profits. You know, talk about, you know, full, you know, all sensory, you know, illusionary interactive systems, you know, creating full complex narratives that are completely disconnected from reality. Talk about full epistemic collapse, the, uh, the semantic apocalypse. Even if AIs don't kill us, they're going to drive us insane. So it's because it will just be, harder and harder and harder to survive in a more and more adversarial informational environment. This has already been happening for a very long time. You know, we just had Thanksgiving. And as much as we love her, we all have that one aunt that get way too into QAnon, you know, a while back. And imagine, so, you know, currently stuff like QAnon or like, I don't even know if QAnon is still a thing, but like whatever the newest thing is, the newest cultist, newest whatever is, you know, that affects, you know, some percentage of the population, you know, some percentage of the more vulnerable population. I don't even say stupid, just like, you know, maybe emotionally vulnerable or like epistemically, you know, vulnerable. And for some reason, not trying to judge these people here. Now imagine the bar keeps raising. You get systems that become more and more convincing that become more and more sophisticated, more and more targeted. And slowly, slowly, the number of people who are just functionally schizophrenic keeps going up until at some point people cannot converge on reality anymore. And people, just every person you meet is functionally schizophrenic. You cannot run a society. You can't organize a system if you and your neighbor cannot come to a conclusion about basic reality. This is like what is possible with these kinds of systems. I'm not saying this is going to happen next year. I mean, maybe, but this is the kinds of things you can do. Like the, like epistemics is hard. Like this is a thing that like, there's also things like honesty is hard. This is like, some people are like, oh, just, you know, misinformation is a trivial concept. It's almost become a slur at this point. It's going to become a joke. You know, like when people use the word information, like at least in my social circles, a lot of people like roll their eyes and be like, oh, yeah, anything that isn't big media isn't is misinformation, whatever. But like, it's just not that easy. Like finding out what, what is true and disseminating and evaluating what is true is hard. This is very hard. It takes energy. It takes effort. It takes mechanisms. It takes like it's hard and it's going to get harder. It's going to get more expensive. Like currently, like. Do you really know what's happening in Ukraine right now? Really? I don't. I don't. I think I'm at a point where it is like literally impossible for me to actually know what's going on in Ukraine. It's something that affects me, you know, affects family, friends, you know, it is a huge thing. I don't think there is any way I could actually acquire and verify the, the truth of what is actually going on there. And this generalizes. This is even before we get into agents doing worse things than this. I mean, automating all jobs, obviously, you know, anything you can do with a computer, an agent will do better and faster. So there will be complete economic collapse from that. Like, obviously, there will be no more need for human jobs unless uh, until the inference costs, you know, get too high. But, you know, you can improve those back down. You'll have systems that can do harm in various ways, you know, by um, manipulating cam- you know, markets campaigns, politics, you're going to have systems that are, you know, cyber crime, hacking, you have system like, it's like when you ask a question, like, what is the worst thing agent based systems are doing? You're asking the question, what is the worst intelligence systems can do? What is the worst that a human can do? The, the answer is a lot. Yeah. Uh, but again, yeah, I mean, you can you can see uh, that that very bleak future, but I'm I'm also a, a great believer in in how uh, mankind the, the 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 worst case scenario generally uh, is not what uh, happens uh, and. 
people kind of muddle along and but that's survivorship bias there was a man named stanislav petrov who was a, a russian soldier stationed in a nuclear bunker and he had the command that if american missiles appear on the screen he shoots the missile and one day six missiles appeared on his screen his commands were very clear the second guy with him there who had you know the other key was ready to turn and yelled at him that it's time we have to shoot back the americans are attacking and Stanislav didn't. He disobeyed orders. He could have been, you know, fucking executed for that. And he disobeyed orders that day. And it's because of this one man, one Russian soldier, that you and me weren't nuked. One guy. We got lucky. So when people say, oh, but so far, I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? This is like saying, well, I played Russian roulette five times so far, and it's been great. Let me pull again. That's just not how anything works. This is not how reality works. If you play like this, then eventually you predictably lose. You have to play strategies where you can win in adversarial environments, where you can play, where you can win in games where dangers exist. Our ancestors, when they were in the wild, they couldn't be like, well, all my forefathers survived, so I don't have to worry about bears. You know, none of my forefathers got killed about bears. No, (laughs) like that's just, no. This is not how things work. The world isn't nice. There is no arc of history. There is no God that is protecting us. The fact that we are here today is because of the hard work of our ancestors. The fact that I live in this nice, you know, warm apartment, that I'm like safe, that I have enough food to eat and so on, is not God that gave me that. It's not some, you know, force of nature. It was the hard scrabble and bloody fight of my ancestors that left me this. And if I let this to rot, if me and other people don't maintain society, then it just dies. Like this, then entropy wins. Entropy always increases and entropy is death. So if we just sit back and hope things will go well, they will not. So, uh, you know, I was going to, I was thinking, well, that's a good place to end it, but I don't want to end there <laughs> because, uh, Our last conversation uh, got an inordinate number of views, and uh, I have some producers that that take these and turn them into shorts, and they have these sound bites uh, from that episode that have gotten an enormous number of views uh, because people gravitate towards these doomsday uh proclamations and 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 i don't i mean whether or not they're true i want to end on something more hopeful uh so what 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 should people do in your view what should regulators be doing what should researchers be doing what should microsoft be doing yeah so the weirdest thing i would tell you it's like to be clear i don't like being the doom guy. I absolutely don't like this. I was the pecto optimist throughout my entire life. I was always the person saying, no, we can fix problems. Climate change is solvable. You know, solar power is getting exponentially cheaper. You know, we could do carbon capture. We like, there are so many things we can do. I've always been saying like, no, like, you know, see how in the internet has improved education, how much people are becoming, you know, better at, you know, and having more access to information. Look at how so many things are like, I was just reading the other day about how slowly over decades just the flash freezing of frozen food has gotten better and i've noticed this just like my frozen broccoli i'll make it night it's just a little bit nicer and you know what that might sound like a teeny thing compared to all these other things but i think that's beautiful i think it's extremely beautiful that life gets better all things being equal life has gotten a lot better i'm very happy to be alive when i am right now all these small things done by these smart people, mostly done for profit. Sure, the broccoli company, you know, they, they just want profit. But ultimately, they made my dinner a little bit nicer. It was already fine. Like, I was already surviving. But it was a little bit nicer. And you know what? That's, that's, that's awesome. And it's so nice that we can live this way. The truth is, is that we are so lucky. that We live in a society full of educated, smart people that, for the most part, you know, not all of them are angels. They're not heroes. But they want to make, they do want to leave the world better. You know, they want people to be happy. They want people to be safe. Most things being equal, you know, almost everyone 
you know, given the option, if they could just help someone else and it didn't cost them anything, they do it. And that's really nice. So we have to leverage this. We have to leverage that we, and this is not the case everywhere in the world, I want to say. This is something that even today is not in every country. It is not in every place or in every society. But in the West and, you know, many other countries in the Far East and so on, most people are educated. Most people are decent. Again, I'm saying they're great or heroes, but they're decent. And they want the world to go well. They want their kids to grow up and have a nice life and, you know, eat nice frozen, you know, uh, broccoli, you know, whatever, you know, they, they want to and see art and beauty and, you know, music and so on. And we can have this. This is the important thing to understand. The important thing is sometimes I talk about this, is that like this, this idea of techno optimism, quote unquote, it's just cynicism in disguise. This is a really important thing to understand. These people who put who talk about, oh yeah, actually we're we're, we're techno optimists, we're accelerationists or whatever, they're just cynics. They're just libertarian cynics that don't believe that society can be improved except by just like giving themselves to this abstract process of technology. But technology is not a force of nature. It's not a thing happening to us. It's a thing that we do. It's like it's about humanity. It's not about technology. The, like, sure, technology is great. It has helped humans. But I only care about technology because I care about humans, because I care about people. And we all care about people. We care about our families. We care about our friends. And technology should be a tool. It should not be a goal in and of itself. So when people talk about, well, AGI is inevitable, someone's going to do it. No, no, it is not. It is not inevitable. It is not a force of nature. It's a decision we make. It is a decision we make. And we can do better. We can as people, as societies, as civilizations make choices. We can say, hey, let's be a little more careful. That doesn't mean we'll do, not do any AI anymore. We can just say, hey, give our scientists a couple more years, a couple more decades to understand the mathematics of interpretability better. And then maybe we'll give it another shot, you know, like we did with human cloning. These are what is important. I'm not saying that this is easy or that this is what's going to happen. It's because it's not what's going to happen by default, but it's just important that there is this poison in our society that believes that the future is already decided. And it is yeah. not. The future is not yet decided. We still have a choice. It is not yet too late, but, but it will be soon. Hi, I wanted to jump in and give a shout out to our sponsor, NetSuite by Oracle. I'm a journalist, and getting a single source of truth is nearly impossible. If you're a business owner, having a single source of truth is critical to running your operations. If this is you, you should know these three numbers, 36,000, 25, 1. 36,000 because that's the number of businesses that have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, because NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So, you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need all in one place. As I said, I'm not the most organized person in the world, and there's real power to having all of the information in one place to make better decisions. This is an unprecedented offer by NetSuite to make that possible. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash I on AI. That's I on AI, E-Y-E-O-N-A-I, all run together. Go to netsuite.com slash I on AI to get your own KPI checklist. Again, that's netsuite.com slash I on AI, E-Y-E-O-N-A-I. 
They support us, so let's support them. That's it for this episode. I want to thank Connor for his time. Uh, if you want to read a transcript of the conversation, you can find one on our website, I on AI. That's E-Y-E hyphen O-N dot A-I. And as I always say, uh, the singularity may not be near, but AI is changing your world, changing it rapidly. So pay attention. 